Dr. Bishop. Here. Dr. Diego. Here. Dr. Lewis. Present. Mr. Serrano Present. Ms. Wright. Here. Dr. Yip. Here. Ms. Jarosofsky. Present. So I'm going to uh, turn the microphone over to our um, ALJ, Mr. Mandrin, please. It remains yours now. Is council ready for the first item now? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Do you want to take a seat and then we'll go on the record? against Robert Earl Dawson, MD. This case bears agency case number 16, 2011, 216641. Today is February 5th, 2014. It's almost five after one in the afternoon. Panel A of the medical board is sitting in Burlingame, California. This is the date, time, and place set for oral argument in this matter. My name is David Benjamin. I'm an administrative law judge for the Office of Administrative Hearings. Assigned to preside over the oral argument today, I will not join the board when it goes into closed session to deliberate. And take the appearances, please, beginning with counsel for complainant. Deputy Attorney General James Zach Simon on behalf of the complainant. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, it's Albert Garcia on behalf of the respondent, Dr. Dawson, who is present. Good afternoon to both of you. Good afternoon. Uh, the background, as I understand it, is that the board entered a decision in this case on July 29th, 2013. That decision revoked respondent's license, but stayed the revocation for five years, during which time Respondent's license was placed on probation subject to certain terms and conditions. The board subsequently issued an order granting a stay. And on September 5th, 2013, the board granted respondent's petition for reconsideration and the matter was set for oral argument today. We're here for oral argument only. Arguments must be based on the existing record. No new evidence will be accepted. If counsel advances facts in support of their argument, counsel may be asked to cite to the particular parts of the record where those facts were established. Board members may ask questions as the argument proceeds, but may not ask questions that would elicit new evidence. The procedure that we're going to follow today is that respondent will have 15 minutes to make his opening argument. Complainant will then have 15 minutes. Respondent then has five minutes, and complainant then has five minutes. At the conclusion of the closing argument, I'll give Dr. Dawson the opportunity to personally address the panel if he wishes. Uh, if he chooses to do that, he'll be placed under oath. That will conclude the public portion of the agenda. The board will then go into closed session to deliberate. The board will not issue a decision today. The board will issue a written decision after it deliberates. So, Mr. Garcia. Thank you very much, Your Honor. First of all, I'd like to uh, have you get acquainted with Dr. Dawson. The position is, sits before you here has had a long and very distinguished career. He's practiced for more than 30 years. And like you who are sitting there at, at the table there, uh, he was also a member of the Louisiana State Medical Board. Having been appointed as you were by the governor, the governor of, of Louisiana. So he is a person who has a very long and distinguished career and one that uh, was so distinguished that he actually was appointed to be a member of the medical board in Louisiana. So he sat there, you're sitting down, down in Louisiana, 
and then it undertook the same responsibilities that you're undertaking today and other instances of regulating the profession. <coughs> Now, what occurred in this case occurred over a two-month period. January and February of 2011, Dr. Dawson self-prescribed some medications. And we, the important part about uh, being able to come up with an appropriate penalty for that misconduct is to take everything into consideration, all the facts and circumstances surrounding that very aberrant behavior, I'll say it that way, because you don't practice for 30 years and have a distinguished career, a distinguished professional career, and get appointed to the state medical board, and then suddenly wake up one morning and say, well, I think I'll, I think I'll violate the medical practice act today just for fun. It doesn't happen that way. Something happened, and you need to be aware of the circumstances that surrounded that aberrant behavior that occurred over that very brief period of time. January, February, 2011. Now the records show that Dr. Dawson was suffering by, from bipolar disorder. And the evidence in the record indicates that that disorder was being mismanaged by his psychiatrist. He was taken off of certain medications. As a, re a result of that, he had some episodes that people with bipolar disorder have when they're not on the proper medications. So he's under the care of a psychiatrist and certain medications are removed. So his bipolar disorder is being mismanaged and we have evidence in the record here. We had a psychiatrist by from Louisiana who testified at the administrative hearing. And that psychiatrist is currently Dr. Dawson's treating psychiatrist and has been since April 2011. And he told the tribunal that uh, Dr. Dawson was compliant with his medication regimen and that his bipolar disorder was under control. Fine, so we have a bipolar disorder issue. Now to aggravate the situation, uh, there was a time when Dr. Dawson was suffering from a knee injury. And again, the record shows that that knee injury was misdiagnosed uh, as bursitis, when in fact it was a, a meniscus tear. And a meniscus tear, as the record indicates based on the uh, testimony, is a more severe kind of injury, one that requires surgery, and one that uh, is very painful to endure. So we have a confluence of two situations here, the misdiagnosis of the bipolar disorder, the mismanagement rather, and then the misdiagnosis of the injury. And that occurred, that's when the misdescribing occurred. It occurred over that two month period when he was, Dr. Dawson was not himself because his bipolar disorder was being mismanaged. And of course he was under a great deal of pain because his knee injury had been misdiagnosed. Now I bring that up not to excuse the misconduct. I bring that up not as a way of rationalizing it in any way. I bring it up because these are mitigating circumstances. These, when he self-prescribed pain medication during the two-month period in January, February 2011, those were the actions of a desperate man. He was in pain and he, his uh, judgment was impaired because his bipolar disorder wasn't being managed properly. So that's what happened. A two-month period during which he prescribed for himself pain medication. Now, that's very important because I've been doing these cases for many years. And when we speak of physicians who are self-prescribing, the image that is conjured up is somebody's doing it for recreational purposes. They're doing it for fun. They're doing it because they get a high out of it. And of course, in those situations, you need to take the, the proper action and impose the proper sanction. That's not what occurred in this case. Far from it. That's not what occurred in this case. And again, the explanation they're giving you is not meant to justify it in any way. Dr. Dawson, from the witness stand, acknowledged responsibility for his misconduct, notwithstanding that there were these two uh, factors involved that caused his aberrant behavior during the two-month period. 
You know, the record also shows that when Dr. Dawson was taken out with a particular medication that affected his management of his bipolar disorder, he knew something was wrong. He knew something was amiss. And the record shows that he sought treatment back in June of 2010. He consulted with a psychiatrist. Then I believe in uh, December of 2010, he went for a psychiatric evaluation at a hospital. And then in January of 2011, he voluntarily admitted himself for psychiatric care. So he knew something was amiss, and he was taking care of it. He was trying to take care of it. He was looking for help. Now, at a February 2011 board meeting, the Louisiana State Medical Board, Dr. Dawson showed up, and he exhibited some bizarre behavior. And his fellow members on the board took note of it, was brought to his attention. He was asked to stop practicing medicine. He was asked to consult with a physician's health program in Louisiana, which is something like the old diversion program here in California. And Dr. Dawson did those things. He complied with the request. He stopped practicing. And, and in fact, the record shows he wasn't even practicing at that time. But nevertheless, he agreed not to practice. He consulted with the physician's health program. And that's how this uh, situation started in Louisiana. And then there was a consent order that was uh, entered. And Dr. Dawson was placed on three years probation in Louisiana with restrictions in terms of conditions of probation. Now, within one year, after having been placed on probation in Louisiana, within one year, the board reinstated his license without any restrictions. One year. So he did one year under the terms and conditions of probation in Louisiana. And then after only one year, those restrictions were removed and he was reinstated. His license was reinstated without any restrictions whatsoever, except that he continued to report to the Physician's Health Program in Louisiana. So uh, before the administrative hearing was conducted in this matter, doctors, Dr. Dawson's Louisiana license had been reinstated without any restrictions. And this was part of the evidence that was presented. Now, the, uh, the argument that I made in my written remarks has to do with some of the mitigating evidence being left out of the decision. And that's important because, obviously, this panel looks to that proposed decision to get all the information necessary to arrive at an appropriate penalty. So if we have some missing pieces out of that, out of that evidence, of that evidentiary presentation that was made, particularly with regard to the question of penalty, uh, mitigating circumstances. Remember, this is an out-of-state case. So the only issue at the administrative hearing was really penalty, because the underlying basis for the exercise of disciplinary jurisdiction uh, uh, authority was already there. Louisiana took action, California could take action. So the only question is, what are we going to do with Dr. Dawson in terms of a penalty? So the mitigating evidence becomes really, really important and significant in a case of this nature. And if any of the pieces are left out, then when the panel gets the proposed decision, if you don't have a complete picture of all the mitigating circumstances, then obviously that affects the kind of uh, penalty that you feel is appropriate for that type of case. And so, once again, I, I stress that the aberrant conduct took place over a very brief period of time, and there were circumstances that explained it, not justified it, but explained it. Otherwise, you know, you sit here and you scratch your head and you say, well, how can someone with this kind of career, with this kind of professional CV, uh, do something wrong like this all of a sudden? And, and so there is an explanation for it. That's what happened. So you have to look at the whole picture. You have to look at his prior unblemished professional career before that two-month period, and then that was in 2011. And then we have another period of time, since 2011, where again, he's, he's not having any difficulties, and in fact, his license is reinstated in Louisiana. Not only was it reinstated, but the State Board of Medical Examiners in Louisiana honored Dr. Dawson with a plaque 
commending him for his years of service to the people of Louisiana, and in particular the healthcare professionals in Louisiana. And that plaque was presented at the administrative hearing, and the uh, inscription was read into the record, and lo and behold, it doesn't appear in the, pro the proposed decision. And I think it's important. Uh, that's, this is the same state board that imposed the penalty in the first place is now honoring Dr. Dawson. And so I think that that's important uh, information that was left out of the proposed decision. So, one of the issues, the, 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 the main issue that was argued at the administrative hearing was obviously what are we going to do with Dr. Dawson in terms of a penalty. And I argued for a public letter of work around. My argument was that you look at all the facts and circumstances of this case, it presents some very unique circumstances, and one that deserves a very unique approach in terms of what the penalty would be. So I argued for a letter of reprimand. And the counter-argument that was made was, well, you know, Dr. Dawson has bipolar disorder, that's a psychiatric condition, and we don't have a diversion program in California anymore, and so how are we going to monitor Dr. Dawson, how are we going to make sure that he remains compliant with his medication regimen, for example, that he continues to see a psychiatrist? How are we going to do this? And the argument is, well, we can't. It's just impossible. There's no way that we can do that. And I, again, I've been practicing for 20 years doing these cases, and I've heard that refrain many, many times. And it's one of those things where if you say it enough times, you start to believe that it's some sort of uh, God-given law or something, you know, it's like a law coming down from above and uh, like the law of gravity, we can't deviate from it. Uh, we have to follow it. Excuse me, three minutes. Thank you. Uh, and the fact is that, as I've indicated, there was another case with a psychiatric condition and findings of incompetence that was decided by your brothers and sisters over Panel B just a few months ago. And there was a psychiatric condition and the medical board, panel B, in that case, issued a decision with a letter of reprimand. And they say, report to us once a year from your psychiatrist a declaration saying that you're still under treatment and you know, that you're uh, undergoing medication with the regimen following it, and you can have your, your letter of reprimand. So that's how you do it. That's what I suggested at the administrative hearing. And it can be done because, in fact, it has been done. And I think that that would be the appropriate penalty in this case, a letter of reprimand with conditions attached. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, before we start the assignment, I should have mentioned to counsel before you started, I have a packet of documents here. They include the Attorney General's argument on non-adoption, respondent's uh, written argument on reconsideration, the first amended accusation, the proposed decision, the board's decision, the order granting stay, and the order granting reconsideration. Do you want this packet marked for identification? Yes, sir. Thank you. Ms. Simon? Your Honor, when you... Um, um, you'd like the packet marked as well? Yes, I would like to state I called my argument non-adoption. It should be the argument on reconsideration. I apologize for that. So we're talking about the same document. The Attorney General's written argument. From April. Right. And Your Honor, I'm sorry, I apologize, but you do have the uh, respondent's written argument on reconsideration? Yes, I do. Thank you. Let me double check. Dated January 20th, 2014. Is yours, Mr. Garcia? Oh, uh, one moment, please. Yes, thank you very much. And Ms. Simon, yours is? Dated January 17th. January 17th. Yes, I said April, that was wrong. January 17th. All right, I'll mark those documents collectively as exhibit one. Uh, Ms. Simon, you have 15 minutes. Good afternoon. I'd like to start off by briefly responding to a couple of the uh, points that Council made that um, were asserted as errors in the decision. And first of all, um, 
Dr. Dawson's written argument states that the decision is flawed because it does not include all of the facts upon which the decision is based. The APA section 11425.50 does not require that every fact be included in the decision. On the contrary, it says that the factual decision and the factual statement to be included in the decision is to be a concise and explicit statement of the factual and legal basis for the decision. If we had to include each and every fact, we might as well just have a transcript instead of a decision. Going to the critical evidence that counsel claims was not included in the decision, um, he suggests that the decision leaves the impression that Dr. Dawson's self-prescribing of controlled substance was somehow done for a recreational or a purpose other than pain management. Dr. Dawson did testify that he self-prescribed when his judgment was impaired because of his manic phase of his bipolar disorder and also because he had had a misdiagnosis of a knee problem. Um, but that fact is explicitly not acknowledged in the decision. It's noted in two different places that Dr. Dawson testified that he took the controlled substances because of legitimate knee pain. I would direct your attention to page 3, paragraph 8 of the decision, and page 4, paragraph 11. The argument also states that the decision did not include the important mitigating fact that Dr. Dawson completed an ethics course. In fact, that is included in the decision at page 5, paragraph 14. Um, the argument and counsel's argument here today states that it is inexcusable that the decision did not mention that Dr. Dawson received a plaque from the Louisiana Board of Medical Examiners to um, commend him for his service on that board. It's somewhat difficult to make sense of this assertion because the decision goes into some detail about Dr. Dawson's long and impressive career. Um, I would direct your attention to pages two and three of the decision. The decision specifically notes Dr. Dawson's service on the Louisiana Medical Board. It specifically states that he has received numerous honors and awards for both his professional work and his civil work. Um, it really is, in light of Dr. Dawson's, everybody agrees he has had a long and impressive career and has done a great deal for his professional and his professional and personal communities. But it is somewhat preposterous in light of the impressiveness of his career to suggest that each and every honor needed to be specifically addressed in detail in the decision. Finally, on this point, the case um, issued by Panel B last fall in the SHU decision, which I believe is S-H-E-U. It's important to note that decision is not a precedential decision. And under the Government Code, under the Administrative Procedure Act, Section 11425.60, a board decision may not be expressly relied upon unless it has been designated as a precedent decision. Thus, that decision is really neither helpful nor appropriately cited or relied upon in this case. The question before the board at this point is not whether there is some conceivable way that the board could fashion a decision that is different and we could come up with something different. It is rather what is the appropriate response to the evidence that was demonstrated in this case. And I would submit that the decision as it stands, and the, it was a well-written and excellently reasoned decision, appropriately and correctly used the medical board's published disciplinary guidelines. Um, to do as Dr. Dawson suggests now the board should do um, in the case of a doctor who has had an exemplary career would be to undermine the very reason that we have disciplinary guidelines. And that is so that everybody who comes before the board is treated in a fair and comparable manner. And absolutely
absent compelling factors that frankly are not present here, the board should adhere to the guidelines because as the guidelines themselves state, they set forth the discipline the board finds appropriate and necessary for identified violations and they serve to promote uniformity, certainty, and fairness and to further public protection. The facts here are really pretty straightforward. Dr. Dawson has bipolar 1 disorder. It is a serious condition which by definition and according to the testimony of his treating psychiatrist carries the risk of impaired judgment and impulsivity. And that is exactly the way it played itself out given the testimony and evidence in this case. The disease includes symptoms that are severe enough to have an impact on social and occupational function. Dr. Dawson has been in treatment and stable for a relatively short period of time. And his um, manic phase and the manifestation of impulsivity and poor judgment um, that led to the Louisiana action were not as suggested by counsel today because of mismanagement of his condition. And in fact, Dr. Vassell, Dr. Dawson's treating psychiatrist, testified that he believes that the destabilization was brought about by a change in medication, which Dr. DeSalle said was a reasonable decision when he would, Dr. Dawson was taken off of one medication due to side effects. And I would direct your attention to page 13 of the transcript for that. It was not because it was mismanaged, it was because that can be the course of the disease and the treatment of the disease. Now, Dr. Dawson's issues in 2011 and 2012 resulted um, in a license suspension in Louisiana, followed by a period of probation and discipline, and currently a requirement that Dr. Dawson remain a lifelong participant in the monitoring program run by the Louisiana Board. We also have to still deal with the fact that regardless of the circumstances under which it occurred, and by no stretch of the imagination could we call that an emergency situation, Dr. Dawson always had physicians who could prescribe to him, um, but he did self-prescribe controlled substances. Louisiana continues to take the steps necessary to make sure that Dr. Dawson stays stable, stays on his prescribed treatment, and that he is safe to practice. They do that through their physician health program. California consumers deserve no less protection. Um, and the issue here is not whether, while Dr. Dawson remains in Louisiana and practices, whether he complies with the Louisiana um, board's requirement that he participate in the physician health program, but we have to look to California consumers. If Dr. Dawson decides to relocate to California to practice, as he indicated he may well do, he would no longer be under the monitoring of the physician health program in Louisiana. He would not be monitored at all. Um, and the way that we have to monitor a physician under those circumstances is set forth in our disciplinary guidelines and it is through a reasonable period of probation and monitoring of required treatment. And we propose to, the decision that was issued in this case and adopted by the board does set forth the types of terms and conditions that would accomplish the goal. The one point I would make is that there, the evidence at the hearing really did not suggest that albeit there was self-prescribing of controlled substances, that Dr. Dawson has a substance abuse problem. So it would not be unreasonable to remove the conditions requiring an abstention from drugs or biological fluid testing. The monitoring necessary would really go towards his, um, his bipolar disorder, control of that condition, and of course, it would, he would have to complete the prescribing practices course that was that apparently has been required by the physician health program in Louisiana as well. And I have nothing further at this time. Thank you. Mr. Garcia, you have 
uh, five minutes more. If Dr. Dawson is going to address the board, then that comes out of the five minutes. That's not fair. <laughs> I, I told that statement. It's okay. Thank you very much. Well, uh, I, I will say that Council is correct. I made a mistake. The, the decision does reflect that Dr. Dawson took the ethics course. And I apologize for that misstatement. It does reflect that. Now, in terms of the shoe case, I think that's an important case. And again, I'm not citing it as presidential, uh, as a presidential decision. I'm not saying you're bound by a shoe. And I'm not saying you, need, you, need, you don't even have to rely on the shoe. I'm not saying that at all. All I'm saying is look at what the board has done in a comparable situation. And comparable is in these facts. Dr. Shu suffered from a psychiatric condition. He suffered from major depressive disorder. And there was a finding made by the medical board that his ability to practice medicine was impaired by the psychiatric disorder. And not only that, and in this case, the two cases are dissimilar, but it only bolsters my argument. And that is, in the Shu case, in addition to the psychiatric condition, you had findings by the board saying that Dr. Shu was incompetent. Not simple negligence, not gross negligence. He was incompetent to practice anesthesia and internal medicine, aside from the psychiatric condition that he also suffered from. And nevertheless, panel B said, public letter of reprimand, how are we going to monitor you? Send us a report once a year from your psychiatrist, letting us know that you're still in treatment and that your condition is stable. You mean to tell me we can't do that with Dr. Dawson? I suggest the quarterly reports, not yearly, but quarterly reports from the Physicians Health Program in Louisiana. Reporting to the board quarterly, yes, Dr. Dawson is still compliant, he's doing what he's supposed to do. Now in terms of California, the reason Dr. Dawson might have to come to California someday, and this is in the record, is that he has a, a daughter here who's disabled. She lives here in Northern California, so he, depending on her circumstances, he might have to come out someday to care for her. That's why he wants to retain his California license. Now, as to Dr. Dawson coming to California, we can make a condition of, of a public letter of reprimand that he notify California in advance if he intends to come here. And that way we can transfer the monitoring here so the psychiatrist here in California, such as in Dr. Shu's case, can then notify the board quarterly or yearly or whatever other whatever frequency you want, that the doctor is uh, compliant with his treatment program. So it can be done, and the guidelines are guidelines. And uh, when, you, when you adhere to them blindly, it says five years probation, so you gotta give Dr. Dr. Dawson five years probation. That's not a guideline. It takes on, it takes on, it takes on another dimension. It ceases to be a guideline. It's, 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 it becomes some sort of steadfast rule that you can't deviate from. So uh, guidelines are guidelines, and, and, and you can deviate from those guidelines when you have unique facts and circumstances, which I believe exist in this case. Thank you very much. Thank you. Does that conclude respondents' presentation? Yes. Do we have time for Dr. Dawson after uh, after a council makes her remarks? I don't want to keep track. All right. Yes, you have three more minutes. Oh, I could have kept talking for a minute too. Three minutes left over. Okay. Okay. I really don't have anything additional to cover, Your Honor. I believe it's in my in the brief and then my comments too. All right. Thank you. Dr. Dawson. Next stand. I'll swear. Solemnly swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the statements you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. Thank you. Stand. Dr. Dawson, you have three minutes. Good afternoon. I want to thank you all for giving me this opportunity and consider reconsidering my case. I would like to say that uh, I know the difficult position that you're in because I too said where you said, such as Mr. Garcia said. And I do weigh the safety of patients uh, above any personal uh, privilege that a physician has here in California and our Louisiana. 
Um, it is prudent that you recognize that I've had a stellar career, and that's been the, with the exceptions of uh, scholarships, national direct student loans, and, and uh, grants. I regret the circumstances of my actions, and I take full responsibility for that. And as Mr. Garcia said, it was an aberrant behavior uh, that occurred. I did seek help. And just like I'm saying that I'm accountable for my actions, I do think that the physicians that I saw in Louisiana should be held accountable as well. Um, that's not something that I sought to pursue, but I did come to California because I'm a veteran and I thought that I could get the care that I deserved at the VA Medical Center here in San Francisco, as well as at the Palo, Palo Alto Medical Center. Uh, after leaving California and going back to Louisiana, which is my state of birth, um, the place uh, where I wanted to go, become a doctor, and bring health care back to the citizens and the residents of my neighborhood, I wanted to get the best care that I possibly could, and that's how it is that I saw, sought out Dr. Trent to sell and testify on my behalf. He said that even though I have bipolar, which was diagnosed in July of um, 2010, that it was the right diagnosis with the wrong decision, with the wrong uh, treatment. And that treatment was to discontinue the medication that I was on and to put me on clonazepam, which, add in, which added insult to injury. And that in itself is a long-acting benzodiazepine and which lends itself to disinhibition. So please consider that, that as well. Prescribing self control self um, uh, prescribing self-control narcotics is not something I had never done before. Um, I did have a torn meniscus. I've had surgery. I've since had that, since that time, have had the course in that class. Um, I'm nervous. Uh, I did have the course for prescribing controlled substances, and I know the mistakes and the pitfall that a physician can make in the one that I did as well. So, I see that there was no exceptions that were afforded to me by the Louisiana State Board of Medical Examiners, not that I was doing it, but it seems to me also that the actions that this board would be taking would be maximum uh, as regards to revocation. And most of the cases that we did in Louisiana were not by guidelines, but on an individual by individual basis. And so the sanctions, the restrictions, the prohibition, the revocation, is, is maximum and I think severe. Abstinence from controlled substances, I don't use drugs, they're listed are prescribed. I don't drink, I don't smoke. Maintenance of records, you open to be, I, I voluntarily would give you those. Biological fluids, I've had that for two years. Never tested positive on anything. Um, psychiatric evaluation, the Menninger Clinic, Altamira, the VA, they did not say that I had any uh, dis misuse or abuse problems. And as regards to psychiatric therapy, licensing, um, and uh, psychiatric and psychological treatment, I'm undergoing that in Louisiana. And if for the reason of having to take care of my daughter here in California, I would be agreeable to doing that. Doctor, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I have one more minute. Working as a solo practitioner, I very much would like to work in the VA uh, Medical Center. Um, administration uh, and being considered for a position different than where it, it is that I'm working now in terms of geriatrics. And as Mr. Garcia said, I think that in some way that you can um, bestow mercy on my situation, see it as being uh, individual and as different and uh, practice in a way and deliberate in a way that takes care of and looks at me as an individual and one like you a physician who sometimes needs care and who needs to be managed in ways uh, that uh, disease presents itself. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Counsel. Thank you. Let me, before you go, let me see if there are any questions from board members. Board member, yet? Any questions? No? Oh, board, board member Lewis. Um, I have a question for the Deputy Attorney General. Um, Simon, you're opining that the uh, prognosis for bipolar disorders is a major factor in this case based on 
Dr. DeSalle testified that Dr. Dawson has the more serious form of the bipolar disorder and that that disease by definition um, includes symptoms that are severe enough to have an impact on one's social and occupational function um, and that it is, it is a lifelong condition um, that the hallmarks of a bipolar disorder that is not properly controlled at any given time are impulsivity and lack of judgment. Um, so I'm saying that that is a serious condition and one which the Louisiana Board has seen fit to deal with by requiring that Dr. Dawson have a lifelong contract with their physician health program to monitor the condition. Uh, okay, and that's based on the expert testimony from uh, Dr. Tassel, right? Yes, and on the status of Louisiana <clears throat> at the time it, the case was pled, it was based on the probationary order of the Louisiana Board and at the time of the hearing on the fact that Louisiana had essentially morphed Dr. Dawson's monitoring over to their physician health program. And was it the expert opinion that if Dr. Uh, Dawson was under proper psychotherapy, that this uh, risk for um, uh, reactivation or um, of his uh, bipolar dis uh, disorder would be uh, problematic? Was that the uh, opinion of the experts? I believe what Dr. DeSalle stated was that if there is less of a risk um, he did say that the risk is less if the treatment, if the, doc, the patient follows the treatment recommendations and remains on medication. Okay. Thank you. And I have one question for Councilor Garcia. Yeah. Um, you are, again, aware of our um, manual bottle disciplinary orders and uh, disciplinary guidelines, right? Yes, I am. California, and that there are minimum and maximum uh, penalties according to the violation, right? Yes. And the minimum for here would be five years of probation, correct? Correct. Okay. And um, the question I have also here is Louisiana, although they uh, reinstated uh, Dr. Dawson's medical license without restriction. Uh, to me, that doesn't seem actually completely true because they also say that he still requires Louisiana case manager supervision. Yes, by restriction, and by the way, uh, that's not my language. That's actually an order saying that he's being re reinstated without restriction. <clears throat> that's an order right. in Louisiana. So it's not my characterization. It's the actual language of the order. Restrictions apply to, for example, uh, you can't perform su surgeries, or you can't do this, you can't do that, you need a chaperone present. Those are kinds of practice restrictions. Now, obviously, because of the bipolar disorder, uh, he is required, Dr. Dawson is required, to continue participating with the Physician's Health Program in Louisiana. And that is a requirement that was imposed, but it's not characterized as a restriction. And again, it's not my characterization. That's the actual order. Counselor, do you know how long this process is, was supposed to go on? Is this ad infinitum? I, I don't have a... It's, it's a lifetime... Lifetime... Yes, it is. Lifetime process right. for the case manager. Right. And just to go back to your question about the guidelines, I'm familiar with you know, minimum, maximum, that sort of thing, but I also am familiar with some language uh, prefatory language in the guidelines is saying that they're guidelines and you can deviate from those guidelines either upward or downward depending on the unique circumstances of the case and I think this is one of those cases. Thank you. You're welcome. Shall I go around to all of the board members or let me? Uh, board member Diego, board member Wright. I, I just have one question. Um, Council Garcia, you cite the shoe case and did Dr. Shoe self-prescribe? No, there was no self-prescription in, in Dr. Shu's case, no. It was a, just a psychiatric condition. Board Member Yaroslavsky. Uh, board Member Yip, any questions? Board Member Sulu. Board Member Bishop. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Uh, we're going to go off the record. Thank you. Thank you.
the board is now going to meet in closed session. Uh, and they would like to. Yes.